if we can. And as you're making your way to the table, um, I'll just reiterate what a, a rich discussion this morning on the experiences and the, and the burden of, of, of your disease and those of your family members. We're going to be moving into a discussion topic two on the perspectives on current treatment approaches to, treat, to treating Huntington's disease. I'm Sarah Eggers. I'm in the Office of Strategic Programs. I'm one of Salgenia's colleagues. And I will be um, facilitating the conversation in the second half. We have a lot to cover in a short amount of time. Um, uh, so we have a very full public comment um, interest. So we will be having to, to um, make sure that we um, save the appropriate amount of time for that. We're going to try to cover as much as we can in, in the next um, 55 minutes. As we talk about treatments and current treatment approaches, we did hear a little bit this morning, um, earlier in the morning, that reiterated and provided some thinking of patients and caretakers on treatment approaches. We're going to delve a little bit further into that. Because we have so much interest in this meeting today, um, what I'll ask in topic two is that we really try to work on the, the range of experiences. And I'll go to you and say, does, does the experience that you heard from this person resonate with you? And that's how we'll really build upon um, the discussion. So let us know with, with any way you can to indicate that what someone else is saying is the thinking that you have as well so that we can focus the comments on really trying to get as much material covered, as many treatments, as many things that you care about treatments covered uh, in the next um, 55 minutes. We have uh, five panelists for topic two. They're going to go through um, their experiences and set the dialogue, just like we did for topic one. Um, and then we'll move into the facilitated discussion. With that, I think we're going to go with James first. Yep, James, thank you. Uh, mm, well, my name is James Novola. You know, I've heard down in Kent's disease, you know, for 10 years. Uh, you know, I'm having a bad feed there, you know, so I can't talk that well. And I'm going to have my girlfriend, Jessica, talk for me. Hi guys, my name is Jessica, and like Jim just said, he's had Huntington's disease for 10 years, and today he woke up not feeling very great and doesn't feel like he's going to be able to communicate, so I'm going to try and read his speech to you. Um, he is currently treating his HD with Nemenda, Venifluxine, Risperidone, Tetrabenazine, Mirtazapine, and Trazodone. He also uses over-the-counter meds of CoQ, fish oil, and multivitamins. Other things he does is pray, exercise when he's able to, sleep, he does not use alcohol, caffeine, drugs, or tobacco at this time. Uh, the treatments address the chorea, impaired mental processing, and personality changes. After he tries the med, if it doesn't have any side effects or make his symptoms worse, it works by improving his, his symptoms, but never completely cures him. His meds have changed frequently over the years, because at some point, every increase or new medication becomes overpowered by the disease. When he first displayed symptoms, he was only put on one medication. Now he's on many. He starts the med at the lowest possible dose and then increases the dose slowly over time to maximize the beneficial way the medicine works for as long as possible. At this point, he can no longer even exercise anymore. Uh, his current treatment regimen makes the most significant symptoms of his disease better, but nowhere near a tolerable condition. Even at the current state, his HD is horrible awful, the worst disease he could have ever been given by God. He says he just started tetrabenazine and it's improved his cognition and chorea. He's now actually able to play with his son Vincent, three, who is playing on the floor here. Um, he cannot drive, cook, or interact with friends or do many other things that he used to be able to do. But tetrabenazine did help him to be able to play with his son, which is amazing. Um, although the tetrabenazine is helping, it's not taking enough of his symptoms away to leave a quote-unquote normal life. Before he started the tetrabenazine, he felt like he might die soon because he was at the point where the meds were overridden by the disease. Now, after taking it, his symptoms are much better, but it's also not a perfect or even tolerable condition. The most significant downside to his current treatment and how it affects his daily life 
that the treatments are never enough to give him that quote-unquote normal life, and the treatments don't cure him completely or permanently. No matter how well the treatments improve the symptoms, it never stays that way, and his disease continues to progress. An ideal treatment for Jim would be a medication that could control the chorea so that it is gone completely without having the effect of the drug being overpowered by the disease. So I hope to prove to lay, you know, motivate him to carry C. And, you know, I'm really hopeful that will. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you, and, and thank you to, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Thank you, Jessica. And the little one? Thank you, Vincent. A, a round of applause for Vincent, please. <laughs> I think our youngest ambassador in the room. And now we will hear from who is, uh, Karen will go next. And we'll try to get the mic, okay, you're going to use the microphone. Hi, I'm Karen Millick from Florida. I'm 54 years old. I, uh, in order to try and delay the symptoms and the, the disease from taking over my body, I do a lot of things. I got gene tested 21 years ago at the age of 33. That was the year my mom was pretty sick uh, in the later stages of Huntington's. I needed to know if I had HD, and if I did, I wanted to do everything I could to stop the HD from taking any, any more people in my life or any more people in the, in the world. I tested positive and signed up for a drug study called Care HD for CoQ10 one month after I got my results. Just being part of a drug study makes you feel a lot better already. I have been taking CoQ10 still for the last 21 years. I know they just did a last study and they said the CoQ10 um, wasn't working as they wanted to do and they stopped it, but I am still on it. I am not going to stop something I knew help energize my brain when I first was on it and I have no been, uh, any side, bad side effects on it. I also have been in predicted speed for 11 years and I sign up for all the research to let me do. I am lucky that being in studies makes me feel useful and gives me hope. Some people get nervous doing the studies, not me. I also went to my first HDSA convention when I learned where I learned so much information about the disease, met so many folks, and I helped uh, start a support group back in Florida and start fundraising for Huntington's disease. I've been to 19 HDSA national conventions, and they helped me stay, stay very informed. They always make me feel good and include me in a lot of things they're doing. I also have been on the FDA advisory committee for the new drug uh, for tetrabenazine when it was approved. I was uh, the, the um, the uh, person for Huntington said they got to come, so thank you guys for letting me be a part of that. I also, I uh, exercise all the time on my own, and uh, ever since I was a kid, I like to run. And I continue to exercise, uh, because now they have um, so many studies that they're saying that exercise is going to help our bodies and our brains fight off everything. I run, bike, and swim. I even, I, I work, so I run on my lunch break every day. As far as the diet, I eat a lot of blueberries for the antioxidants. I also take 2,400 milligrams of fish oil, I six, uh, 10 milligrams of creatine, 700 milligrams of acai, and the 600 milligrams of the CoQ10, and a multivitamin daily. Uh, sometimes I forget to take them, but I, I try to do it. Uh, since I'm a single person with no children, I can take more risk with my body by climbing up the spinal taps and taking the new drugs in the study. Uh, I have been taking a medicine for irritability and my OCD for a very long time, like 21 years, way before any of my, um, you know, the, uh, Huntington's disease symptoms will show up, but that happens way, way before. Right now I take 100 milligrams of Zoloft daily. And if I uh, forget to take that, I am 
irritable, and the people around me know this a lot. <laughs> uh, so I try to keep my brain cells alive and working. Uh, I still have a job. I, I used to, I work at FedEx. I used to drive, but I went off, I, I got off the road and I don't drive anymore because I know driving, uh, seems to be an issue with us hunting people. And I just chose to get in the office ahead of time before, uh, someone was in town and it was a problem. Uh, a lot of us people go hunting things, keep driving even when we shouldn't, and I was afraid that I might be one of them, so I just, decided ahead of time to get a, a non-driving job. Um, anything I work on in chores took a lot longer. I kind of go from one task to the next and, and leave a lot of things unfinished. I don't like to clean my house like I used to. Um, I just watched my sister pass away at the age of 50 this year from Huntington's and my other sister is 56 in a nursing home with Huntington's and um, both of them have tried to commit suicide a number of, well, one actually put herself in the, the, um, the facility before she did it, and the other one has tried it three times. And, uh, it's not good. You know what that. And, uh, I drink Diet Coke still, and I know it's supposed to be bad folks, but since my body seems to be liking what I'm doing, I'm going to stay on everything I've been doing. I'm not going to change, so. Um, alright. Uh, Any final thoughts, Ken, well, that you'd like to well, share? Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. okay. So I want, well, in my independence is very important. The more I can do to stay independent with what I want to do, because uh, after that, I, I, I don't think that's living anymore. So I, I, I want things to make us independent. And uh, I want to say, for the drugs, I... In treatment, I would like something that can slow down the progression so we can start showing uh, symptoms a lot later in our life. Not at 30, 40, or 50, but like at 70 years old, we'll be okay with me. Death is a part of life. I just like it to be a lot later on. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. Now, uh, Stacy. Okay. We'll have Stacy go. Hello, my name is Stacy Sargent. I'm from Douglasville, Georgia, and this is a picture of my son, Corey, who's now 21. I was very young when I decided to get married and have children, and family history was not important to me. I thought I was young and in love. When Corey was born due to an abusive relationship, he was born three months premature, weighing only two pounds. No one thought he was going to make it in his little incubator, attached to a ventilator, feeding tube, and numerous other machines, but he was trying to push himself over. So I knew early on I had a fighter on my hands. I knew that due to his premature birth that he would always be developmentally delayed. When he started school, Corey had some learning difficulties and a slight speech impairment. First grade, a student intern in the special ed program tried to diagnose Corey as autistic due to echolalia. We went to a neurologist who decided Corey had ADHD, and at that time the drug of choice was Ritalin. Luckily, knowing what I know now, I refused and did diet modification. A few years later, we started noticing that Corey had a facial droop. Took him in to his neurologist for an MRI and was given the diagnosis encephalopathy. That in order to get insurance to cover therapies and to put a label on him that everyone would understand, he was given the diagnosis of spastic cerebral palsy. By age 10, he started walking on his toes. By age 12, he had another decline affecting his posture, ability to walk, speak, eat, and swallow. It was time to find a new doctor because this one wasn't listening. I knew something was wrong with my child. Numerous neurologists looked at me like I was crazy. Finally, one showed concern and ran tests, ruling out metabolic disorders. Finally, Corey started having itching, kicking, kicking like a horse, unable to sleep at night, often lasting for days at a time. The doctor decided to try cinnamon at that time. It was our miracle drug. He still had the itching, but it was controlling his sleep and he was able to, it was controlling the kicking and he was able to sleep. That medication was started in 2009, one tab at bedtime. 
Here, now in 2015, we are on two tabs three times a day and one as needed. Often when he gets agitated, it increases his chorea and dystonia. Sometimes even the sentiment doesn't help, and we have to give him pain meds in order to help, help him sleep and give him rest. It was discovered when Corey was in the hospital getting diagnosed in 2009 that he had many ulcers of his esophagus and stomach. I was devastated in 2009 when I got his diagnosis, a CAG of 85, because there's nothing I, I knew I could do to help my baby boy. I cried, I screamed, and then I cried some more. As a mother, I'm supposed to kiss my child's hurts away, but because of Huntington's, those hurts are so much more profound than I ever, ever imagined. At the age of 15, instead of getting a learner's permit, he was learning how to use a wheelchair. The disease progressed so quickly that, that, that by the age of 17, he was unable to speak, unable to attend school, head down, and completely dependent on us for his every need. He is on meds for chorea, dystonia, reflux, muscle relaxers, seizures, sleep, itching, pain, and agitation, all only providing minimal relief. At the age of 18, when he is supposed to be choosing a college to go to, we are choosing which hospice agency to use. He did manage to graduate at 19 something that four years before we had been told we probably wouldn't see. He is now 21, less alert of his surroundings, never had a girlfriend, never had his first kiss, never got scared of prom. Corey never met a stranger. Having a hug and kiss for everyone who ever crossed his path. I know that not being able to control his facial expressions to smile at someone he has just met, to hug and kiss us every night when we tell him good night, I know it has to hurt him emotionally, even though in his eyes I can see him smiling. I do know that this bothers him because recently my sister gave birth to a little girl, a little girl that I took Corey to see when she was 11 days old. He was so excited that dystonia was just so bad, I, I couldn't let him hold her because I was scared he would hurt her. Telling him no triggered a seizure. He has to have Botox injections every three months into his cheeks and chin, into his saliva glands to keep his saliva down because he produces so much he chokes. He can't even control his head to keep from, to try to spit it out. I do this to keep him safe to keep him safe from aspirating. He receives therapies on homebound education, originally to preserve independence, now they are for comfort, and to give me some relief. But those are services that once he turns 22 in February, I'm going to lose. Because see, with him on hospice, we won't qualify for community-based programs. I believe JHD research and trials are important because these kids don't have time to wait. These kids deserve a better quality of life. We need to preserve their ability to think and to communicate so that they can tell us what's wrong and how to help them. We realize that there are risks, that our children are dying. We will do anything to save them. Some of us are even doing things that are illegal, like using medical marijuana in states where it's not permitted. We believe that if they are allowed to participate in research and trials, that at least their death won't be in vain. Our family made a promise to Corey six years ago that we're going to fight this as long as there are breaths and not just our bodies. And we're not going to fight it just for him, but for all the children affected by Huntington's disease. Thank you so much, Stacy. Everyone deserves a round of applause, I think. Um,
I think, is it Cheryl next? Cheryl, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Sullivan Stavely. I'm from Massachusetts, and I'm a patient representative for my husband, John, who was diagnosed at the age of 37, and for my daughter, Megan, who was diagnosed with JHD at the age of 19. John passed away seven years ago at the age of 56, and Megan last May at the age of 26. John was a 12-time Boston Marathoner who ran six miles each day for about eight years in the beginning to early mid-stage of his HD to keep physically active. He kept himself intellectually stimulated by reading textbooks related to his law enforcement career, daily newspapers, and watching the news. He took vitamin supplements, niacin, riboflavin, and coenzyme Q10. After about 10 years, he took Zyprexa to help with his anxiety and depression. In 1996, he underwent a fetal pig tissue transplant to see if the fetal pig tissue could be a substitute for his own brain tissue that was being destroyed. After four years of close observation and taking cyclosporin for possible tissue rejection, the medical researchers felt that the surgery had neither helped nor harmed him. However, emotionally, I believe that it helped him maintain more of a positive attitude. Megan went to the gym three times a week doing cardio and stretching during the early to mid stages of her JHD. After receiving her associate's degree, she continued to audit a couple of classes each semester for about two years to try to keep her mind cognitively active. She took 30 grams of creatine and 2,400 milligrams of coenzyme Q10 for about five years. She was prescribed a wide variety of antidepressants, anti-anxiety, and antipsychotics during her 10-year battle with JHD. At one time or another, she was on Zyprexa, Zoloft, Selexa, Abilify, Ativan, Clonopin, and Remeron. Both John and Megan strive to eat 6,000 calories a day by eating a combination of fruits, vegetables, healthy protein, and carbs, as well as not so healthy, high caloric junk food like ice cream, donuts, cookies, and candy. All of the above mentioned treatments were designed to maintain physical strength, balance, agility, emotional stability, and to remain as cognitively intact and to keep their own personality for as long as possible. As their HD progressed, their level of physical activity declined due to increased career for Megan and rigidity for John. They both obviously experienced decreased strength and balance. Megan tried Xenazine in 2009, but it did not decrease her career. It made her very depressed, agitated, and caused difficulty sleeping for the three months she was on it. John died before the Xenazine became available. However, although this was not its intended use, for Megan, Abilify decreased Megan's career for almost two years in the early stages of her JHD. Cognitively, their ability to focus and read declined, although they both enjoyed being read too. Carrying on conversations ultimately became very difficult due to the delayed thought processes and slurred speech. However, they always seemed to understand what was being said to them, and they could answer yes or no questions. They basically continued to enjoy the entertainment that they liked. John and Megan's treatment regimen ultimately did not help with their career or prevent their cognitive or personality decline. Emotionally, their meds did a good job in controlling the anxiety, depression, and perseveration, which did improve their emotional overall well-being. Significant downsides for both John and especially Megan from the emotional medications were that sometimes it made them apathetic, irritable, restless, and lethargic. When this happened, neither one wanted to participate in varying activities 
or interacting with their family or friends. It also often caused them to sleep all day, be up all night, which was, was, which was very disruptive for them, both when they were at home and each in their respective nursing homes. So Mary, her personality could change, making her more aggressive or negative at times. For my family and I, an ideal treatment would be one that could slow down the progression of all three aspects of HD in general, but for my family in particular, especially the cognitive aspects. I see this, I say this because I know there is some treatment for the emotional as well as the motor aspects. To me, and for my family, if each stage of HD could be longer and the symptoms slower to evolve, ultimately that would mean a better, more productive quality of life for a longer period of time. We would consider this a victory so the cure not be able to be fully realized. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Cal. And finally, we have Karen Douglas. Good morning. My name is Karen Douglas. I'm here with my husband, Matt, um, who has Huntington's disease in his family. I'm fairly new to the Huntington's world. We've been um, married for 20 years, um, but I didn't know what Huntington's disease was before we were married. Um, currently, we are doing some treatments that um, We've done treatments in the past that we're not doing now, and I'm sure we'll have other treatments that we're doing in the future. But currently, right now, we have been doing exercises um, with an exercise DVD that he has. He loves the weave with a hand-to-eye coordination, and um, the weave fit for balance. He has ankle weights that he'll wear to wear at his muscles and to keep his feet from flying up when he loses balance throughout the day. We were able to... Um, Obtain a service dog. Some of you have seen Gary around today. He's down here. And uh, that's been a huge blessing in so many ways. Um, it helps Matt with balance. So as he's maintaining his walk, um, he can hold on to the handle. Um, he also helps with uh, picking him up when he falls. I'm still working part of the day, most of the day. And um, when Matt falls, I know that he's able to get up and continue on. Um, he opens the doors for him and he picks up things for him. And besides that, he's a great companion and a great joy and responsibility for Matt to take care of. Um, every other week, we go to OMT, which is Osteopathic Medicative Services. It helps to relax his muscles and the spasms for about a day. So going every other week really is not enough, um, but it does help in some aspects. He has nutritional based supplements like this to try to take care of the 5,000 calories in each day that we've been seeing. Um, and then he also uses technology tools, um, price word for the technology that we have today, with different apps and so many ways that you can use them. He does luminosity with the brain beams to try to keep that memory going and sharp. Um, the hand-eye coordination, he loves his racing games. And um, weight management, we've been using a Fitbit, which has been really a lot of help to me. As he wears the Fitbit, I can tell how many calories he is burning that day, and then how many calories he needs to eat in order to even maintain his weight. Um, so he's been averaging 20 to 30,000 steps a day, and burns about 5,000 calories a day. Um, there's another app for oral management, which is Oral B. Um, so it sets reminders to remind him to do his teeth and to um, be able to remember to floss and rinse and all that type of thing. And then I don't feel like a nag. Um, and then he also uses the social interaction with Facebook and that type of thing. Since he's not able to drive and go out, he's able to still uh, socialize with people that he's had previously in his life. And um, he enjoys that. The prescription medicines, um, Trazodon for sleep, um, mood and anxiety. Um, it has worked, but not to the degree that it helps anymore. Um, so we try to increase and add Haldol onto that. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. 
Um, for movement, he was on phenazine, uh, tetragonazine. He's been on that for 12 years. Thank you to the FDA for approving that. Korea has been our most uh, prominent um, symptoms to have to deal with, and it has been um, not cosmetic. I've heard that before, but it's very dangerous, and we've had some situations that he could very well have harmed himself with. So we're very thankful that he keep been able to prolong independence for a little bit longer um, with the xenazine tetrabenzidine. He said the lanamine hydrobot bromide for memory, Zoloft for mood, Flormax for bladder control, and Ativan for anxiety. Um, as you can well imagine, with all of these different um, drugs, persistent medicines that he's taking, um, there's always side effects to each one of them, and so it is challenging. Sometimes you have to take another medicine in order to make up for the medicine that you're on. Um, so it's a constant journey of trying to balance things out. How does your treatment regimen change over time? It has changed by us having to increase the strength um, as new treatments are added and as the decline continues, we just continue increasing strength. Obviously, it doesn't get to the point that everything is taken away. We just manage. Um, Any final thoughts? We're going to talk about sure. one more product. And then what, what really Matt would like to see out of treatment. Absolutely, thanks. Um, one of the ways that we would really like to see an ideal treatment, um, obviously we would love for a cure, and you've heard that a lot today, um, but I did call some friends and family. It is a family disease. It doesn't just affect one person, and I found that, um, as you've heard from many stories today, so some of the friends and family have said communication options would be really helpful. Um, speech becomes very difficult to understand as you've seen, and then it's non-existent. And so I did see in his mother who had passed away that she communicated with her eyes. And um, that was just really interesting to, to be able to still see her trying to communicate that way. Speaking and swallowing process, um, the fear of frequent choking, um, got to get that weight management taken care of, and therefore you need to eat. And then the movement, as I mentioned, and um, mood, if there's some type of effective low side effect antidepressant to cope with depression and mental anguish, um, that was another thing that somebody mentioned. And in summary, my request would be to continue to approve new treatments coming down the pipeline as quickly and as possible. Um, Matt had that request that sometimes it does take a long time, and so we need it sooner than later, as you've seen and heard from many people here. Um, with it being hereditary and a family disease, our families need the help of the FDA. People ask me where, where Matt and I find our hope, and we really find it in our faith, our family, and our friends. We appreciate all that you guys have done to take a moment to hear from the families here today. It really does make a huge difference, and we've seen your sincerity, and it just really has moved us. So I appreciate your time, and um, hope to echo from everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Karen, and thank you again to all of the panelists for so eloquently showing the complexity of the management of your condition, ranging from the pharmaceutical treatments, but you can't, there's so much else to cover and so much else that you require, and that came out very clearly in your comments today. So um, I think that this demonstrates the range of perspectives. And I, I'll ask for an indication from the audience. Did that, did that reflect the range? Um, you might not have, not everything would have resonated with you, but something did? Something? Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, please, one more round of applause for, for the panelists. We are going to now move in and, and try to delve in a little bit more into aspects of treatment that, that you've experienced or your loved ones have experienced and that matter to you. Again, we're not going to be able to cover every possible treatment or every um, experience, but I think we'll be able to cover both pharmaceutical treatments first and then the range of other, of other um, therapies, but more other life 
um, management um, that require. So I'm going to put up a polling question first. And this is first focused on the pharmaceutical treatment. And I have to stand over here. I'm not going to, um, oh, I can, I, I can go through this list. It's not, a, it's not an extremely long list. So let me walk through it. So again, if you got your clickers out, have you ever used any of the following drug therapies to help reduce your symptoms of Huntington's disease? And you can check all that apply. Tetrabenazine, A. Any psychotic drugs, B. Any depressant, C. Other drug therapies, and let's focus on the drug therapies not mentioned. And E, not sure. Okay, I think we can, okay, a wide range. Um, with the most focus on the antidepressants, but there is um, there's experience reflected all throughout in person, including the tetrabenazine. On the web, can I ask what we have? <laughs> we will come back. We will come back to that. Just, uh, Graham. Never mind. Okay. All right, we're back now. Or bad luck, Mike. Um, everybody on the web who answered this said that they're taking antidepressants. Sixty-five percent said they take antipsychotic drugs. Thirty-five percent say tetrabenazine, and then fifty percent say other drug therapies not mentioned. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, one thing I want to um, reiterate: if we don't get to cover all the topics here. We had a hard time identifying the panelists who would represent and kick off the discussion because you sent in collectively a tremendous response to you sent in your comments to us. We will use those comments and they will be reflected in our report as well. So we have all the comments that you might have sent us. We also have the public docket. So if you're hearing something and you want to build upon it and we don't get to discuss it today, that docket, where you can electronically submit your comments, is extremely important. It doesn't matter if you already said it here today. You can expand upon it um, in the docket. So please remember to go home, to think through, and to submit a comment on what you're hearing today. So with that, let's go into a few comments on tetrabenazine. And when we talk about any of these therapies, what we're looking for is how does it work for you, or how did it not work for you, and how did you know, and how long did you give it, how long did it take before you, you were able to come to some sort of determination, immediately, or some, some time, or you tried it for long enough, and then you decided, and then it was determined that that wasn't the right treatment for you. Any comments on Texas? So we'll go here first, and then we'll go into the back over there. Is it right? Well, here's Julie, well, what did you have? I'm sorry. So this is Julie, and well, <laughs> I think I'm not. But tetrabenazine, as we know, is only good for Korea. They put me on Korea-type drugs, tetrabenazine, just because there's nothing else around. I got so sick on that drug that it was not worthwhile for me to take. Okay. And uh, Again, we have to work on things that are available for other types of symptoms in Korea. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that point, um, which is a point that is, I think, going to, to um, be reiterated and, and, and is resonating. Um, that's it. Hi, my name is Laura Randall. My Hello. son is 26 and has Huntington's. Um, I'm just, we don't, he doesn't take any of those drugs up there. So um, he has... Uh, really bad tremors that affect everything that we've heard today. He can't, he can't really do anything himself. So he's taking Depakote, which is a um, uh, seizure medicine. Mm -hmm. um, he takes uh, Cinemet that we've heard of, and he takes Amantadine for the rigidness. But what I've noticed is it seems to, it's all trial and error. 
great, and you don't know if something's working until you don't take it. So, you know, so what do you look for? Well, how do you know it's working for your son? He is it's horrible. If he misses a pill, I know right away. It. He can't walk. He can't. He can't do anything himself. You know, he has a really bad day. And most of the time, I find a pill in the pill box, or I find something on the floor. Or, mm -hmm. you know, so. Um, we've, I've tried to take him off the medicines because I don't think they're working, and you know, as soon as we go off them, it's like the, the symptoms are ridiculous. So I, I feel like there should be a better way, you know. And, and we've heard today that all everybody has different symptoms and it's affecting everybody differently. But it's, it's just such a hunt and peck at this point. You mm -hmm. know, what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. it's very maddening. And I want to ask the dumb question of the day: since we've known the, of the genes. Since 1993, why aren't we working on that? That's what we should be working on. Your question has is is an important one and and is resonating with others. Um, so let's go on to another comment, an, another experience here. Thank you. Oh, and then and then I'm sorry. Then we'll go back. Is there someone back there? Okay. Uh, again, my name is Carlo Castro. Um, I think that I want to emphasize the comments made by the panel about prevention and somehow um, making sure that we're not discussing treatment during the symptoms as much as we might be able to before they occur, whether it's uh, over-the-counter mixtures, fish oils, and things of that nature that have some efficacy, um, but also things that can be um, given to whether you're at risk or you are gene positive very, very early, um, well before onset. Thank you very much. Um, Ashley, was there someone back there? Okay, then we'll come and we'll see. I just want to make a comment. Aiden hasn't been on tetrabenazine since it's for Korea, but he's been on antipsychotic medication and Code and several anti-epileptics, not only for his seizures, but for mood stabilization. But I think one thing that I want to point out is that when we talk about the way that HD patients metabolize medication, we can be on a medication for a very brief amount of time and we have to increase it. So, of course, we all want to cure, but when we're talking about meds and when we're talking about how our kids and our husbands and wives and whatever loved one we're talking about, um, sometimes the meds just aren't it. We need to find a cure. Well, let's go with, okay, we'll go here and then we'll go with Colleen. I, okay. Another thing I'd like to mention is that except for tetrazinazine, none, none of these others are approved for Huntington's disease. And that can be a problem. Um, for example, my son had been taking Mimentine or, or Namenda, and it was helping him a lot. But then the insurance company said they wouldn't pay for it anymore because it wasn't approved for Huntington's disease. And so we had to jump through some hoops and do appeals that failed, and then I had to take him to a neurologist and have a neuropsychiatric battery of tests done and proved that he had dementia, and then they would approve it. So we need these other drugs, the antipsychotics, the antidepressants, the mood stabilizers, the uh, drugs for cognition. We need those to be approved for Huntington's. Thank you for that point. OK, we'll go with Colleen. Feel free to clap. It's a good way to show that you got that a comment really resonates for you, so feel free to clap when something resonates. As I mentioned before, my sons were complete opposites, my son and my moon. The only drug that helped Miles with his um, severe cognitive processing and integrating uh, the outside world into his reality was Depakote. The only drug that helped Jason with his violence was Depakote. Um, and I actually had to fight for Jason to go on Depakote because no one thought it would help his violence, but it did. Uh, he was being sent to the psych ward regularly from the nursing home. Once he went on the Depakote, that completely ended. He became very calm. The other um, 
to non-drug things, clinical trials. Um, my sons were in the best place during clini clinical trials, especially clinical trials that they saw, um, the, you know, they went into the hospital frequently. You know, not the ones where you go like maybe once every two months. Um, that, of course, alleviated some of their depression. It made them feel in control of things, and it it also gave them hope. The only hope they ever had was clinical trials. So, you know, the expansion of that would be great. I started with clinical trials with my children in, and myself and my husband in 1979, and it's one of the best things for the treatment of Huntington's disease. Um, the other thing is not really related, but um, my grandson was born using genetic testing uh, in vitro fertilization, and my son knowing that he wasn't going to pass the disease on was huge, huge, because I know what it did to me to know what my children were at risk, and he didn't have to suffer that. So those were the three things that I think had the best impact on my mm -hmm. son. Thank you, Colleen. Oh, thank you. I'm going to turn, are there any questions on any particular drug therapy that you'd like to ask? Time is tight, so we're going to move on. Okay. Let's let's go in and and um, and see. Let's move on into the non the other types of therapies. I'm sorry, time is is we've only got a few minutes left. So, uh, okay. We'll take one one comment here from um, what was your name again? Bird. <laughs> um, I'm taking a couple of things mm -hmm. off label. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm taking verapamil, which is a calcium channel blocker, and it it's um, when I took it, it restored my creative thinking abilities mm -hmm. and um, and countered my apathy. I'm also taking the Minda, but I have to pay. So my, you know, I have to pay extra for it. And I'm also taking melatonin. The Naminda and melatonin were recommended by a neurologist who's not a HC neurologist. And the verapamil was, I heard about through the Stanford Hope site, but I'm taking it at my internist. He prescribed it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Roy. I saw a lot of people, um, um, nodding with what you were saying. Okay. okay, we will really go with one more, and then we are going to move on to the, to the non-drug therapies. Please go ahead. Um, okay, um, I just wanted to add really quickly that um, tetrabenazine worked really well for my mom, um, and that, that was a really important drug that really helped control her chorea, but um, near the end it, it got really bad, and even that couldn't control it. And the worst part about the drugs and trying to treat the symptoms with my mom was she, she would keep on changing. Like one, one symptom would get really bad, and then you would fix that, and then something else would get really bad. Mm -hmm. So like mm -hmm. the, the motor symptoms or the cognitive. So it was just constantly juggling, and every single day was a new, a new uh, puzzle to be solved. And as soon as you fixed that, then it would just all start all over again. And she was obviously deteriorating throughout, and so, I mean, it, it, it's, it's really, really tricky to try. It isn't, like, definitely not, like, one answer here, and um, I wanted to also say that I have been positive, and um, I have 45 CAG count, and I am 31, and I don't really know what I should be doing to try to be as healthy as possible other than eat a good diet, and work out and, you know, um, I see my therapist and I have uh, Prozac, 40 milligrams a day for my depression, which seems to help some, but I don't really know um, what to do. I was on CoQ10 and creatine until I saw that those really weren't working, so, um, yeah, so I don't really, from a full person that is being positive, that is um, trying to Save off HD. It's it's really it's really hard to have that cloud, that shadow hanging over my head, especially after seeing what it did to my mom and taking care of her. And um, so, thank you, thank you. Um, the for the others whose symptoms have okay. okay. You've, you've answered my question then that that this is an experience and perspective that's shared by others. Um, who, who maybe have not reached the point of progression of symptoms yet. 
We were going to ask a question about um, other therapies, but I don't think, I think in the interest of time, there's a few wrap-up questions we want to get at, and we want to get at a web summary. But um, I think we heard, so let me just show if you can indicate somehow um, the importance, if you, the importance as was shared of others of the non-drug therapies currently to your, to your, um, to your overall management or the management of your family members. So we have one comment back there, so we will take that. Yeah, my name is Kenneth Serban. I'm known in the HD community as Jean Veritas. My mother died of Huntington's disease in 2006. She had 40 CAG repeats. We tested our daughter uh, during the pregnancy in 99, 2000, before pre-implantation was available. She tested negative. It was the happiest day of our lives. Uh, today she's a healthy 15-year-old uh, in high school. Uh, when I see, saw my mother uh, and uh, get symptoms and die, and uh, when I see someone with HD, I say it's like looking into the genetic mirror because I'm looking at my own future. Uh, like Karen, I'm an asymptomatic gene carrier, and uh, I really would like to see a medication that prevents me from ever getting any kind of symptoms. I'm very lucky at this point, at age 55, well past the point when my mother had onset of uh, all types of the symptoms. She began with the mood symptoms, then it developed into chorea and uh, cognitive loss, memory loss, so on and so forth, swallowing difficulties. A really important point I want to make uh, uh, to the FDA is that uh, I think that uh, there's got to be a really open dialogue with the scientists working on the new areas such as gene silencing. Uh, I don't really know why, but uh, the first gene silencing clinical trial we have is happening in Europe and Canada. And uh, I couldn't really find out from the company, Isis Pharmaceuticals, why they didn't want to do it in the U.S., but they're not. I was disappointed at that, so were a lot of us in the HD community. Hopefully in phase two and three, if it gets to that, we can include uh, people in the United States. Mm -hmm. I've also heard from uh, drug company executives uh, who want to use uh, MRI, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, and other uh, kinds of new technologies, or ways of looking at these parts of the body, uh, the brain, uh, the, the CSF, uh, the blood, uh, where the new types of biomarkers are being found, that there's been, uh, uh, as it were, a kind of uh, uh, lack of flexibility on the part of the FDA. And, and uh, I'd really like to urge that uh, these new kinds of uh, technologies uh, that can get us to looking at uh, drugs that will help gene mm -hmm. positive pre-symptomatic people like me avoid the disease. I think you're raising a, a, a really good point that I'm going to ask for in the docket um, because the asymptomatic gene carriers, you um, you have a different, well, everyone has a different perspective, but your perspective is is um, very different from people who are more in more advanced stages. So make sure that the asymptomatic gene carriers, you're telling, you're telling us, sharing with us what you want to see in the future before you ever have symptoms, what's going to matter most to you to either um, to either identify or delay or or um, or address it um, right away. The same goes. We're going to have to move on. The same. So I'm going to put your homework assignment for the docket. Think at all stages. Oh. Well, you didn't hear your homework assignment yet. <laughs> at, at all stage. At all stages. Um, you know, what is it that that you wish you could stop or you wish you could slow down or you wish you could um, um, regain if that was at all possible? Tell us what those specific aspects, think of them as things that could be addressed perhaps by a pharmaceutical therapy, but saying what is the cognitive, the behavioral, and write that into us. We aren't able to address all your comments, but we will read all of them as they come in. So there's your homework assignment. We have um, one person on the phone. And before that, we'll go to that in a second. Um, 
William, could we get a, uh, just a brief summary of what we're he hearing on the web? We have a very large web presence, and we so much appreciate. I'm looking where, where the camera would be, so I think you're looking so that we appreciate um, your contributions as well. So keep those webcast comments coming in, because that's where the chair is. Which um, we had the camera today pointing so that people on the web can see you all. You are the most important people to be viewing today. Yes, so wave hi to everyone on the web. <laughs> Sam, please. Um, so we have uh, several people are talking about tetrabenazine, um, uh, various responses. People say that it helps gain weight and reduce movement, but several people are mentioning um, issues with uh, perception and depression. Um, and then we had uh, several people who are asking questions about uh, the current state of gene therapy and the progress of gene therapy in the future. And you can ask, we, we might not be able to answer questions, but you can ask your questions, yes, what are those most important questions that you have? What are the things you want FDA to know that you're concerned about and that you have questions about? Um, and that is this important feedback on what your perspectives are in, in terms of treating this condition. We have one person on the phone, and so I'm going to ask, um, Ask, who's on the phone? The op oh, yes, that's right. Operator, can we have a caller, please? Yes, Yvonne, the line is open. Is it Yvonne? Uh, good yes. morning, everybody. My name is Yvonne Swinton. I live in Henderson, Nevada. I am an HD ambassador, uh, which means I'm very involved in HD uh, cure. Uh, I do have a diagnosis. Just got it. I have a 41 uh, CAD. Uh, it ran in my father's family. He had it. His father had it. We lost most of his side of the family to AC. It's like a holocaust, but a different kind. So what I, I agree with everybody. I echo all of you, and I applaud you for going there. What I uh, agree with mostly is, first thing, you need a diagnosis. Thank goodness we had one early in our family. So we all had choices on whether or not to have children, whether or not to pursue a certain career, whether or not to get married. So it was, we, we didn't allow it to define our life, but it definitely helped us make decisions. The second thing is the connection, the support. I feel connected to all of you because I, I, I have a defective HD gene from my father and a normal HD gene from my mother. So therefore, um, we're all connected either by uh, whether or not you have the disease or we're part of the family. The third thing is the cure. What I learned at convention this summer, and thank you to HDSA for a great convention, I learned that the scientists are so excited about a cure. They are going to find a cure, and it will be in our right time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. There were a lot of heads nodding. Oh, you're getting a round of applause from, from the folks in the audience. Any final um, things from the panelists? No. So I want to thank you all um, for such a rich discussion. It was so rich that we have gone a little bit over our time. So we will ask the, there's going to be a public comment next. I want to ask you really to keep um, your comments brief. If the comment that you um, have to make is really resonated with something, with someone, something someone else said, you can just agree with that person and, and, and we'll, that way we won't be rushed as we go through our public comments. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for coming today. So we're now moving into the open public comment session. And for those of you who are not aware, the purpose of this session is to allow an opportunity to, for those who have not had a chance to speak on issues that are not related to our two main discussion topics today to uh, present your thoughts. Um, please keep in mind that we will not be responding to your comments, but they will be transcribed and be part of the public record. Since we would like to make this a transparent process, we do encourage you to note any financial interest that you may have related to your comment. If you do not have such interest, you may state for the record. And if you prefer not to provide this information, you can still go ahead and provide your comments. So we have collected sign-up before the meeting and during the break. We have 12 people who have signed up and roughly 30, 25 minutes, let's say, for this session. So please be respectful 
for other colleagues here and other patients and try to stick to the two-minute limit that we have for each comment. Um, I'll keep in track of time here, and as you approach the two-minute mark, I will have to slowly nudge you to wrap up. So, if, um, so I will run through the order of speakers, and I apologize, apologize in advance if I mispronounce your name. So we have first Cheryl Sullivan, then we will have Jonathan, Mon Montana, Loretta, um, Melanie Rem, Jennifer Mann. Karen Clark, Lise, Lise Better, Brian, Win, Brian, um, Sharon Thompson, Katrina Hamill, Lauren Holder, and Kenneth Sturban. So could I please have the mic to Cheryl, please? Cheryl Sullivan. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so can we move on to Jonathan McMahon? Monk Meyer, sorry. Hi, I'm Jonathan Monk Meyer. Um, just wanted to emphasize that our relationship uh, with uh, the FDA is we really want um, to bring therapeutics through absolutely as fast as possible. Um, you can see it's a horrendous disease um, from JHD on HD. It's just the whole spectrum of suffering, and we're willing to take a lot of risk and are not so concerned about the safety of um, what we want to try. And we're really looking forward to some of these high-tech gene therapies that are curative solutions. Um, a lot of the treatments are really just palliative that are even in the pipeline right now. And it's on everyone's hearts to make a significant difference in this suffering. And we really appreciate being able to speak with you and have this dialogue to emphasize how fast we need to go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Next, we have Loretta Maris. Loretta, are you in the audience? Oh, right there. Hello, I'm Loretta Maris. I have no financial connection here. The support of my friend whose husband is suffering from it. My question is, having no affiliation with the FDA. What kind of reports, I understand you send reports to the pharmaceutical manufacturers. Besides, is there a communication back and forth as they're making progress with their research and development? As an outsider, I would like to know an answer eventually, I guess, about that. Thank you. We don't have time for specific responses, but I'm just going to quickly reassure you that we're intensely engaged in ongoing dialogue throughout the, the, the spectrum of drug development for any given drug. So there, there's active and ongoing dynamic dialogue. I know, there's, I know you'd probably like a longer answer, but we have to move on. But I wanted to at least address your specific question. Next, we have Melanie Wren. Melanie, are you in the audience? Oh. I don't really mean to make I'm very loud. Um, the heartwarming stories that were told today, and I cannot, you know, follow up with anything like that. So thank you for everybody sharing, and thank you for everybody attending today. Thank you, Melanie. Next, we have Jennifer Mann. Okay, great. Thank you, Jennifer. Karen Clark. Do we have Karen in the audience? Ashley, could you get the mic over to Karen? Thanks. Um, since we only have two minutes, um, and I have a lot of really like hefty subjects, I don't really want to delve into them too much. I just wanted to mention that um, uh, you should also be thinking about issues like genetic discrimination and um, getting access to um, getting, changing the benefits. Um, I'm sure someone will follow me and talk more about HD Parity Act and talk about how we need to get that passed so that people don't fall into the, the gap where they don't get any benefits. Because I know when I first put my mom into the nursing home, she wasn't able to get access to 
an um, AC specialist for two years, and she wasn't able to get um, specific AC treatment for two years, and that was just really horrible at the beginning stages of her disease. Well, not the beginning, but the early to mid stages in which some of the cognitive and psychiatric symptoms could have been managed a lot better. So um, in terms of quality of life and all of that, and uh, I, I, I'll, I'll just write the rest of my comments on the docket. OK, thank you, Ken. Next, we have Louise Veda. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to the FDA for hosting this hearing and to everyone in the room for um, contributing your powerful stories. My name is Louise Vetter, and I'm the CEO of the Huntington's Disease Society of America. And I wanted to just raise awareness to everyone in the room, and especially uh, all of the members of FDA who may not have seen the results of surveys that, F that HDSA ran last year to compile the feedback from the HD community, so many of whom could not be here today. We have 250 or so participants in the room and online, but there are hundreds of thousands of families affected by Huntington's who cannot be here. HDSA ran two surveys focused on the symptoms and the treatments for Huntington's disease, and we had more than 3,600 respondents that provided powerful information related to the symptoms that are most impactful and also the treatments they are most hopeful for. We've provided top-line summaries to the FDA in advance of this meeting, all of that data is available to you as you mine this area and bring treatments forward. I also want to pick up on just one other thing that Ken Serban and several others in the room have mentioned, and that is the need to really consider the needs of pre-symptomatic individuals affected by Huntington's disease. As we talk about treatments for those who are symptomatic, it is also very powerful to include the feedback of those who are watching the future play out in front of them, the families that they're caring for, and the needs and visions they have. So I would encourage you to listen carefully to their feedback. And I would encourage everyone in the room who may be thinking about this to make sure that your feedback is included in the docket loudly. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Next, we have Ryan Wisnett. Did I say that correctly? Ryan, are you in the room? OK, we will move on to um, Sharon Thompson. First of all, thank you so much to the FDA for giving us the opportunity to make our voices heard. Those of us who are here are speaking for thousands of others who couldn't be here. I have two things that I would like to add. Um, first of all, with the um, treatment of the psychiatric symptoms. We're all familiar with genetic testing, but there is now also genetic testing for psychiatric meds. And uh, I don't know that many people are aware of that yet. The psychiatrist who treats my son has used it with a number of patients who are very difficult to medicate, and it helps to pinpoint which particular psych meds will help rather than, you know, trying something for a month and then something else for another month until you hit on the right thing. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is we need to change the diagnostic criteria for Huntington's. We need to be able to get a diagnosis on the basis of the so-called soft symptoms, the psychiatric and cognitive symptoms, and not depend on Korea for a diagnosis. Thank you, Sharon. Next, we have Katrina Hamill. Thank you. Um, I spoke a little bit earlier about my, my family situation, and there was just something that I had left out that I thought was you know, not mentioned, and that had to do with um, my mother becoming homeless due to her situation. So um, I'll just read a little bit of what I wrote quickly. Um, but my mother died three years ago at the age of 50 from complications with HD. She suffered for half of her life, 
half of those years she was suffering. Um, she left her family of three kids, her husband, um, and she left to Connecticut with a man that she didn't really know. Um, of course, that was HD-related, and she just went on a, on a whim. She just thought it'd be a good idea. So when she came back, um, I was 20 years old, and she was 40, and both of us were pregnant. Um, Thank you so much, Katrina. Next, we have L Lauren Holder. Lauren, are you in the room? Lauren, could you just raise your hand if you're here? Okay. Um, and then finally, we have Kenneth Sturban. Uh. Thank you to the FDA for this opportunity, uh, and uh, I uh, just wanted to. Uh, my day job is, a, is as a historian, so I do a lot of historical work and reading in social sciences, and I've observed some interesting things. Panel one, no men. Uh, panel two, uh, practically all uh, women representing men. Interesting bias in the data. Don't know what caused it, but as a person who reads in social science, I thought it was interesting, uh, especially in this day of gender equality. Uh, and the very sample of the meeting itself is, is probably skewed uh, because uh, a lot of, as Louise pointed out, Louise Better pointed out, there's a whole big community out there. A lot of those people can't come to a meeting. People like my mom could never have participated in something like this because she couldn't walk or talk, uh, although she lived many years with HD. And, and even the people at home uh, looking at that list of questions would have a hard time filling out that questionnaire. So I think we're getting, a, and, and I'm not necessarily saying this is bad, but we're getting a, uh, uh, a bit of a caregiver bias on what's going on in the disease. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we have to keep in mind that the patient's data needs to be there too, and that's why. Uh, the docket will be, I think, extremely important, and tapping into the data that Louise referred to is important, too. Uh, early on, it was said that HD is not a very common disease. It's my understanding that among the rare diseases, it's one of the most common. In fact, uh, 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 hundreds, if not thousands of, I mean, in the past few decades, there's been thousands and thousands of papers published on Huntington's disease. So it's a very well-known disease. Uh, and uh, Michael Hayden's work uh, and others have shown that there may be many more HD people out there. In the community, we, we constantly talk about the fact that there are probably more than 30,000 affected individuals out there. Uh, uh, regarding pre-symptomatic people such as myself, most of us don't get tested because of the immense fear of the disease and the fact that there are no treatments. I see this in my own uh, personal experience, uh, and uh, 
there's also uh, associated with genetic testing and getting your results a lot of suicidal uh, tendencies. And uh, I myself, when I first saw what was happening to my mother before I got tested, I thought to myself, there's no way I'm going to uh, go on in life with this uh, if I have to live like my mother. And I did think a lot. I, I never actually had, uh, I guess, a, a real suicidal thought, but I had a lot of fantasies. You know, I'll get my family together, my friends together, and I'll just, you know, drink some hemlock like Socrates and, and say goodbye to the world. I used to think that way, but once my daughter was born and once I got more involved in this movement, I saw that I, I couldn't possibly take my life. But I know that's a thought that occurs to a lot of us having to face this situation. So I guess I just want to close by saying that uh, that pre-symptomatic community out there uh, needs to really be a part of the conversation. And uh, thank you to the FDA for this opportunity. Okay, thank you, Hannah. Okay. And so, I, Billy, would you like to say something? Yeah, I just want to make a brief comment. Thank you for all the comments. I think that concludes the open uh, comment session. We, ha we actually have one person on the phone. No, 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 one person, one more person. Oh, one person. Yeah, okay. But, Billy, did you want to address Sure, this is as good a time as any. A number of you all said thank you to the FDA, and I just want to make a brief comment. We appreciate your thanks, but we signed up for this. You all didn't. You know, this is our job. Uh, I want to. I want to say thank you, and I want to encourage all the all of my colleagues from the agency to say thank you to you for your courage to come here to share your stories with us. Thank you very much. And so I think we have one one more person who wanted to who had um who had signed up um didn't get signed up on time. But I do also, I'm, I had meant to say and put up in a resource, so before we go to that last speaker, that you have talked, and the last commenter talked more about um, the personal struggles um, of, the, of the condition. And we just wanted to remind you that there are resources available, and the um, Huntington Disease Society of America um, um, reminded us of their, of their um, hotline. So please seek resources if if um, if you need them. Okay. So finally, we have Levon. Ken Serban will be a very hard act to follow. Uh, and my comments are really much shorter. Uh, I'm Levon Goodman. Uh, my first husband died of Huntington's disease. Uh, I'm a physician who takes care of Huntington's disease families, and I'm a patient advocate. So I wear many hats. Uh, I also facilitate a support group uh, and uh, help monitor other support groups in the northwest uh, near Seattle. Uh, we conducted a survey there similar to the one uh, that uh, HDSA did, but we added a couple of questions. And that was about, uh, about uh, slowing down progression. And the questions had to do with um, how much disease Slowing would be acceptable before you would want to take a drug that was given orally, or a drug that was given intravenously, or a drug that was given intracerebrally. Uh, and those results were interesting from a number of perspectives. Uh, one, uh, they weren't so sure they wanted to take something if it were 10%. It needed to be closer to 25%. That was their perception. We, I queried only people who had the gene or were, uh, were, had, had symptoms already. This, this was not a, a care provider or, a, excuse me, a care partner or caretaker uh, answer. Um, and, I, and it was interesting to me that, and I think interesting for everyone, that the, um, the the discomfort with taking something um, via spinal fluid, uh, via an LP, would be, was, was as frightening as was an intracerebral uh, delivery. Um, the other uh, thing that I think the FDA needs to think about, and perhaps our, our, our research community needs to think about too, is that there was a question in there about uh, if there were gene-lowering therapy, uh, what risks would you take and how much benefit would you want before you would take that risk. 
uh, and another question that had to do with uh, slowing down the disease progression by the same amount um, if it were, uh, and it wasn't gene lowering. People were more interested in taking the gene lowering therapy, although something that were equally neuroprotective uh, was not as acceptable. And I think uh, the, the FDA and our community needs to educate uh, people that neuroprotection is neuroprotection, whether it's gene therapy protection or not. Um, and I think our community isn't aware of that. And perhaps that's because the FDA won't let uh, uh, people taking, or drug companies taking things into clinical trial that may have some neuroprotective uh, benefit from mentioning that. Thank you, uh, Yvonne. Thank you very much. And if you have any additional comments, please submit it to the docket. So that ends our open public comment period. Um, before we move on to the last agenda item, I would like to um, I would like to let you know that folks will be going around and picking up clickers, clickers, and also we have evaluation forms at your tables. We really want to hear from you to get your feedback on how this meeting went today. So please fill it out. Um, thank you. And finally, I'd like to call upon Dr. Eric Bastings to the stand for our closing. Is, is Eric coming up? We have one earring. Um, that we found. So if it's your earring, come find us. Yes, hi. I am Dr. Eric Basting from the Deputy Director of the Division of Neurology Products. I want to thank all of you today for participating in this meeting. I think what we heard from you today is incredibly valuable, and I want to assure you that we will use that information as we review new drugs for the treatment of Huntington. There was a lot of information discussed this morning, and I would like to use the next few minutes to summarize some of the key points of what we heard. So first, we heard loud, we heard loud and clear that the behavioral and cognitive aspects of the disease have a very deep impact on patients and on their families. In particular, we heard about the memory problems, the difficulties with mental processing, difficulties with initiation, and difficulties with speech. We also heard of trouble with swallowing and the deep impact that that can have on patients and sometimes the embarrassment that that can give when uh, people have to interact with others and, and, and be outside of their homes. And we heard the deep impact on all of these symptoms, sometimes uh, making friends stay away, other members of the family stay away, leading to isolation of patients. So all of these cognitive symptoms are very important. Another important aspect are the behavioral aspects of the disease. We heard of sleep being a, a big problem, in part because of movements that people, patients can have during the night, and issues with circadian rhythm. So sleep is a big problem. Depression is identified very often uh, uh, as a big big impact as well. Anxiety, irritability, and apathy are also aspects of the disease that need to have a lot of attention. The, the mother symptoms are, of course, still present. They, they're not presented by most people as the most problematic, but they also deserve treatment. As you know, we have a drug available to treat uh, Korea and, and a number of people reported some good success with the drug, but it's not an absolute treatment, and there is still a major and medical need in that area as well. GAIT is often reported as a, as a problem in the disease, and we need to have some treatments that would address the issue of GAIT and movement. And again, speech and swallowing are, are reported by many as being a problem. In terms of treatment available, we all know that there is a major and med miniature need. We at the FDA fully recognize the devastating nature of Huntington's and the need to have more treatment, not only to treat the mother symptoms, but especially to treat the behavioral aspects and the psychiatric aspects of the disease and the cognitive symptoms. We heard of people using a variety of treatment. They can be non-drug therapies, exercise, nutritional supplements, 
and there can be a variety of drugs such as antidepressants, antipsychotic medications, and tetrabenazine. Antipsychotic medications are also used. I think this is a good point to assure you that safety is really not, not what is keeping new drugs from coming to the market. Again, we really recognize the severity of the condition, and we take that fully into consideration as we balance the risk and the benefits of the treatment. And for a disease like Huntington, we really would tolerate some significant safety issues before uh, considering not putting a drug on the market. And uh, again, we, we want to exercise flexibility for, for conditions like this, and we, we are fully aware of you know, the, the major and the need. Finally, I, I want again to thank you for coming today. I want to assure you that we share the same goal, which is to find a cure for this devastating condition. And on the way to that, to find any way to slow down the disease, if there are treatments that can be given before patients get symptomatic, I heard some comments about that before, that certainly would be a very good area for uh, targeting treatments. And I want to assure you that the team present here will be extremely responsive and supportive for the development of new drugs for Huntington. So thank you very much for coming today.